Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth webinar presentation by the Underground Construction Association Young Members Group. I have a handful of announcements today, so I'm going to try and give a quick overview of our group and goals to our newcomers and also give you an over, or a list of announcements that are coming up. My name is Erin Clark and I'm one of three members of the new UCA of SME Standing Committee for the UCA Young Members. I'm the Professional Development Chair and I'm joined by Anthony Bauer, the Chair, and Shannon Goff, the University Outreach Chair. The UCA Young Members are a group of professionals and students of all ages with a common interest to grow and develop the population of engineers and construction professionals under the age of 35 within the underground industry. Throughout the year, you can join us for monthly webinars and join our group by becoming a member to our website community at community.smenet.org backslash U-C-A-Y-N. At the annual RETC and NAT conference, we will host a networking event for students and professionals age 35 and under. In a minute, I'll have some more details to add on this year's event. Our monthly webinars will generally be hosted on the last Wednesday of each month. Next month, join us on June 24th at noon Pacific Standard Time to hear Mike Krulik of Trailer Brothers present on the challenges faced on the Regional Connector Project in Los Angeles. As always, you can register for next month's webinar on the events page of our website. I'd also like to let you know about another free webinar coming up hosted by the Robbins Company. This webinar is also on June 24th and immediately follows our webinar at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Ryan Gratis of Robbins and Adam Falstone of Anglo-American are going to present on the changing face of the worldwide mining with the use of tunnel boring machines. You can get more information and register for Robbins' complimentary webinar at http colon backslash backslash bit dot ly backslash tbm mining. We will also post an announcement on our website with more information. My last announcement is to invite you to our networking event at this year's RETC conference in New Orleans. This event will be held on June 7th at 7 p.m. and is an opportunity for students and professionals age 35 and under to mingle and get to know each other while enjoying some food and drinks. The event will be held at the Sheraton in New Orleans. The room is yet to be assigned, so check on our website or the RET website for an update on the final location. We encourage you to pass along this information to anyone you think might be interested and make sure to consider the time of the event before booking your flights into town. And finally, we continue today's webinar series with a presentation by Glenn Frank on the Urban Underground Construction in Glacial Deposits. Glenn received his bachelor's and master's from the Colorado School of Mines. In his 20 plus years of experience, he has worked as a researcher, laborer, machine operator, geotechnical engineer, construction manager, resident engineer, project engineer, quality control manager, and project manager on tunnel and microtunneling projects. Glenn, thank you for, for presenting to us today. When you're ready, please share your screen. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen, Heather? Okay. Yes, we can, Glenn. Looks okay, great. So we're on the right, we're on the right screen. Mm-hmm. Looks okay. good. Okay. So, um, as she said, my name is Glenn Frank. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, t the tunnel that we built in in Seattle um, a couple years ago in glacial deposits, um, very near downtown Seattle. So. As uh, was mentioned, I have a Master's of Engineering degree, CSM, uh, focusing on minus mining, and an Engineering Systems degree from CSM, focusing on civil. I was also in the military before. I went to school at Mines, and before I went in the military, I did a year and a half at a small college in Southern Oregon. And back then, I thought I was going to be a fishing game wildlife management officer. Things change. Um, so my introduction to tunneling, um, I got a work-study job at the Earth Mechanics Institute at CSM about two years after I started there. And at that time, the Earth Mechanics Institute was doing a lot of work with rock tunneling in um, primarily in welded tough at, at that time for the, for the Yucca Mountain project. Um, I was talking to a lot of people that were involved in tunneling that came in and out of the, of the lab there. and I was assured that it was a growing industry uh, for the foreseeable future. It uh, required a good understanding of geology, which really interested me because I did like to be outside um, and, and, and geology was a, 
allow me to be able to do that, you know, getting the, looking at the dirt, basically. And then it's good for the environment. Um, I think that, you know, in the last 20 years, I've seen that pretty much every time something gets put underground, it makes the surface a better place to live. And um, almost every civil tunneling job is required to prevent or to do some kind of pollution. So that was the hook that got me involved. Uh, my work experience, so I did the work study at the Earth Mechanics Institute for four years. Um, and that was as a researcher. Uh, then I went to work for the Vadnais Corporation after I finished up all my coursework for my master's. And I was a microtunnel machine operator for Vadnais for two years. Um, decided I wanted to try the design side and, and to uh, move over to a company called the Shell Associates, which is a small design firm specializing in tunneling. I worked for eight years there as a geotechnical engineer and then as a design project manager. Uh, and then I moved over to the construction management side, worked for HR Gray, which is a local construction management firm uh, in Ohio for two years um, as a construction manager and as a resident engineer. And then back to the contractor side, uh, with worked for JD Contractors eight years ago. Um, and I was a project engineer, then a QC manager, and now a project manager uh, with JD Contractors. So today I want to talk about um, this. Sorry about this slide. I thought I changed it. But I want to talk about the uh, U-230 job. This job started, um, we got notice to proceed in January of 2010. And we got substantial completion in March of 2013. So it was just a little over a three-year project. Um, we did we did write quite a few papers got written on this uh, project the um, this number two here was written by Sam Schwartz uh, with Jacobs Associates which is now with Millen Jacobs and the other six were written by members of the JD team um, on different aspects of, of what we encountered or encountering on this project so if um, you're interested after their words you could look up some of these papers for more information. So the U-230 project was part of the University Link light rail tunnel. Um, there were, the whole University Link was 3.15 miles of tunnel from existing stub tunnels, uh, existing transit tunnels under downtown Seattle to the University of Washington Stadium Station um, on campus of the University of Washington. It was scheduled for completion in fall of 2016. I think they're ahead of schedule. I believe they're on budget. Um, it was all underground, twin board tunnels. There's two stations, one up here at the football stadium um, and the other one here at Capitol Hill. There, was, there, there were and are 10 separate contracts for the U-Link. The U-220 contract was uh, done by Trader Brothers. That was 2.2 miles from University of Washington Station to Capitol Hill Station. And the project I'm going to talk about today was um, three quarters of a mile long um, from Capitol Hill to the existing transit tunnel in downtown Seattle. So here's um, a graphic kind of showing the, where this, the downtown area of, this, of Seattle is um, now. Um, Bertha's right there, I think. Um, and we're, contract value was $160 million. Um, it was Capitol Hill to North Downtown, downhill the whole way. We, our most critical portion of the job was crossing I-5, which has 250,000 vehicles a day on it. Uh, we actually were, um, we had to cross under 32 structures twice, and also uh, a bunch of utilities that were 80 to 100 years old as well as the structures. The tunnels were between 50 and 130 deep, with the exception of where we were crossing the freeway. Um, we were 25 feet underneath the southbound lanes, and we were only 13 feet underneath the um, express lanes, which are underneath the northbound lanes. So they're, they're basically in a cut and cover there. Um, the Capitol Hill box excavation was 100,000 bank cubic yards here. Uh, it was located here. Uh, there was cross passages. There was five. And then there was a pine. There was a shaft for a reception shaft down at Pine Street, right at the intersection of with the tub, with the stub tunnels. So the geology, um, basically, it's glacially deposited. 
at least three glacial cycles um, were present in the, in the tunnel the material that we excavated and tunneled in. Um, the tunnel itself was mostly in um, plastic or non-plastic fine grain soils. There were some outwash sands that we encountered, but mostly it was silts, fine sands, clays. Uh, the water had varied from zero, zero to 55 feet. So the stub tunnels essentially had have drained the water table. It's it's the same as the, the invert of the stub tunnels down here on the um, on the west side, I guess, of the job at the end of the job. So the, the groundwater table climbs up, and then when we're under the hill, it's pretty high. These are the tunnel soil groups or the engineering soil categories of groups: clay, silt, sand, and gravel, which we didn't have in the tunnel envelope. And in boulders, there's the baseline, the standard 42,000 psi, um, and then boulders greater than three feet in our largest dimension. So before we started the work, this the shaft is basically going to be right here. This is Denny Way. Uh, we have our early submittals, the safety, quality, and pollution prevention, or environmental stewardship, if you will, categories for those early submittals. So that's part of, of the process of tunneling in, in an urban environment is there's lots of third parties that are interested, that have their stakeholders, and they have interest to protect. And um, whoever your owner is, the way that they assure everyone that their third parties, the third party's interest will be protected is by requiring a lot of, of planning be done, submitted, and approved prior to uh, certain portions of the work starting. So. Early submittals is a big part of the effort early on in, in an urban environment. Then the next step usually is re utility relocation for this particular job. We had a 36-inch, 100-year-old um, egg-shaped brick sanitary sewer that ran down Denny, storm drain, 12-inch high-pressure high gas line, and then a very high-voltage electrical transmission line, and assorted comm lines, all that ran in the Denny right-of-way. Denny this, this intersection is Broadway and Denny, and we had to basically excavate through Denny. So all those, all these um, utilities had to be relocated, protected, um, put into more modern um, uh, um, conveyance so that they could be supported across the excavation. Then a construction fence was installed with five vehicle and entrance gates. This is what it looks like from the air. This is the picture was, that you just saw was taken from here looking down this way. Um, this is Denny Way. Our excavation is across Denny Way and, and splits the, the work site in half. Um, we had 9,000 cubic yards of soil feet at this location and 6,000 down to Pine Street. The piles, you see the numbers of piles that were installed here and at, Sol and at Pine Street. And then quite a bit of instrumentation was installed. Uh, this is essentially QC um, work. Um, the installation and the, well, the installation of these um, instruments lets you be able to QC the work and make sure that face support or uh, in excavation is always maintained and it was not, there's no lost ground or subsidence in the area, which is very important in an urban environment because um, there's lots of infrastructure and property that needs to be protected from damage due to settlement and subsidence. So pre-tunneling, here's the excavation, some data on the excavation. We did have a DSC. Um, the ground wasn't as easily dewatered as uh, predicted. The, the material down near the bottom of the shaft was much finer grain than was uh, shown in the GBR. So we did have a DSC that slowed us down by two months. Um, then the Pine Street work, much salt, smaller shaft. We did have some CDF and pile removal um, where we were interfacing with uh, temporary support for the previous work for the existing um, transit tunnels under downtown. And then there was a demising wall, which is essentially we built to separate us from the active, um, the operating transit tunnel. Um, near the end of the pre-tunneling work, we poured the inverted slab. This particular contract, we poured the slab. It was up to 10 feet thick. 
um, is essentially a ballast for the, uh, the final uh, station, which would be uh, watertight and essentially a bathtub. So this is ballast to keep it from floating out of the ground. There was 11,500 cubic yards of concrete, 4 million pounds of rebar, and we did in four pours from 850 cubic yards to 5,500 cubic yards. So due to the delays for the DSC, we ended up, instead of doing the whole slab and then moving into TDM, we did, we had to, some of that work was concurrent. So we did the big pour, which allowed us to, at that point, we could, we could move into TDM and then finish up the, the other pours later. The northbound tunnel, um, we, this is kind of a preview of things we're going to talk about. We had uh, the TDM assembly, a launch, um, some overcut proof section I'll talk about at the end. Uh, we attempted a free air face inspection 850 feet in. We did have a pipe. That, so I, I do want to talk a little bit about one issue um, that we find in urban tunneling. Um, there's a lot of desire to install a lot of instrumentation, to do geotechnical investigation, and so what we end up with is vertical holes, uh, borings or borings that instruments get put in or borings that are used for geotechnical investigation that are near the, near the tunnel. And since we're tunneling with EPB and we have face support and we have pressurized fluids, including compressible fluids, um, there's, there's, there's a considerable risk and hazard of um, the job, uh, those fluids making it to the surface, sometimes under pressure, um, and impacting the, the, the civilians and people, citizens that are, work, that are living and working in the urban environment. So we had that happen a couple of times, and I'm going to talk about that um, just so everybody's kind of aware of that hazard. Um, then we had to cross I-5 and landslide deposits. Um, then we had a, a, the reception shaft entry, and the total mining time was 20 weeks. So this is an aerial view of our shaft. Um, these white, these white uh, are pieces of equipment are the gantries from the TBM. So this is when the, the TBM equipment is first arriving on site. Um, we did the we did the large pour here so that we are set. We put in these um, extra uh, struts in the shaft because this is our location where we set the crane up to drop the heavy pieces of the TBM down. The cradle is actually just visible there. That's set up to receive the TBM when it arrives, and then rebar is set up, and we're continuing on with concrete pour in the bottom while uh, preparing for the um, TBM arrival. We, because of the kind of geometry of the sh of the site, we decided to, to use a very large, high-capacity tower crane. It was actually the biggest one in the west coast of the construction site at this time, so that we could um, move equipment and materials from one side of the site to the other side of the site um, more easily, especially, that, uh, especially before we got the bridge installed, but even during the, the entire course of the work. Uh, this tower crane was, was instrumental in this project being a success. Um, so this is another shot that shows the TBM um, in sight, ready to launch. This white is, piece of equipment is the actual shielded portion of the TBM. Trailing gear goes back to about here, um, and it just kind of shows the where some segments were laid out, getting ready to launch. Um, this is when, this time is when the second, or the, um, the second issue we had, the first issue was when we were doing the jet grouting, we, there was a, a well that it wasn't um, completed, wasn't abandoned, wasn't filled with uh, concrete or bentonite. And the jet grout um, material that we were jet grouting ended up making it to that well and, and um, showing up at the surface. That, that happened right about here when we were doing the jet grout block on this side of the shaft. Then um, later on, we had an issue where they were doing some remedial grouting on that jet grout, and they hit an inclinometer casing with that drill um, while they were drilling to put in the, uh, do the remedial grouting. And that resulted in um, kind of, this is the inside of the, inside of the walkway that we had. This was a covered walkway right here. Um, and then there was viewpoints to see into the job. There was often there were people in here watching the job. Um, 
and that this is the roof of that walkway, and this is what happened when that drill drill rig that was at the bottom of the shaft drilling for remedial medial grouting of the jet grout block when it hit that inclinometer. So here's the instrument shown right here, and it and this is the borehole that hit it right there. So luckily nobody was inside of that um, covered walkway when it occurred, and and nobody uh, was impacted. So here we are after launch. We got the tail, uh, the the tunnel uh, blind rings are set up, and this is how the site was for the entire northbound drive. Segments were stored here, here, and here while we were uh, um, operating our grout plant. This is our water treatment plant right here. Um, we had a we had a grout plant, which is this piece of equipment right here, and a shop and our on-site uh, housing, our trailers for the and, and office and dry shed. So one interesting aspect of this was we ended up uh, using this material handler with a camera to load trucks. Um, it was 65 feet from the bottom of the muck bin to the top of the truck, and this material handler was able to sit on the wall that we used to separate the muck bin from the, the working shaft and excavate and bring the material up and load trucks, and it worked out very well. Um, geology was very um, mixed up. We had a lot of glacially deposited um, till at the beginning of the job. Um, this yellow and, and orange is the till. Uh, this beige color here, pe uh, peach color is also till. So there was some sand, this dark purple sand that was supposed to be above the tunnel turned out to be right at the at the top of the tunnel. It, it, and it also turned out that there was this was we dewatered this material down here, but this stayed perched and resulted in an issue for us uh, for cross passage excavation. Um, more the middle section of the geology, we're getting into the silt. It's your blue. This purple is lacustrian and clay. Um, so with silts and clay, mostly middle. Um, one of the, the challenges that the geology posed, especially the more cohesive geology, is we had to condition the soil in such a manner that this didn't occur, which is it's coming out of the screw conveyor and it's bridging across the conveyor, and that's why these guys are trying to chop it up with a pressure washer and a shovel to get it to, to go up the conveyor. And at the same time, we had it to have it so that it was stiff enough so we could load trucks and then these trucks could make it off of Capitol Hill down about a 10 percent, you know, 8 percent grade um, city street. Uh, Seattle is very hilly, similar to San Francisco, down a steep grade and onto the freeway without spilling their load. So, trying to condition it um, to to meet both of the both of these masters was a balancing act. Um, so this is uh, the. Another or third issue where we had uh, materials coming up at, at the surface where we didn't want them to come up. This was a this was a uh, another monitoring well that was in the tunnel envelope, and we were we were plenty deep that that our EPB pressure wouldn't um, push water to the surface. We had about two bar of pressure, and we were you know we were a hundred feet deep there, but we had quite a bit of air um, in the plenum compressed air, and so when that air got to this open conduit, um, it expanded, and buoyancy and expansion resulted in a geyser, essentially. Uh, it wasn't hot, but it was it was high. This tree is about 40 feet tall, and um, the silt got at least that high when it, when it, when it blew. Um, this is somebody's car that was there. So once again, luckily, nobody was injured, nobody was impacted other than this car and another car, so we had to clean some cars up, and we had to capture all of this material, make sure it didn't end up in the storm drain, um, and and it, it, it impact, you know it, it inconvenienced quite a few people on the surface. The fire department had to come, um, but luckily nobody was nobody was hurt. So the last part of the drive, where we crossed under the freeway, this is the uh, this is the structure that the um, express lanes are in, the northbound lanes are above, the express lanes, and then the southbound lanes are over here. So this is the geologists that um, 
look at it, and, and he had most of the slide material over here, and these are slide planes, basically shear planes, and you can see that they they daylight at the on the freeway. Um, when they did this work back in '64, 1964, I guess I should say, um, this whole all of this ground moved when they were doing this excavation. And the result of that is, is that um, they brought in the best geotechnical experts that were, that were available, and they designed a, a wall to hold up, a retaining wall to hold up this hill so they could finish this excavation and build a freeway. And that wall uh, involves 10-foot deep beams. So those are beams that are, um, they go well below this drawing, but they're 10-foot um, from flange to flange. They drilled 10-foot diameter holes, put the beams in, and then, and then encased them in concrete. And the walls, and the wall is just a, basically a secret pile wall, thick, 10-foot thick. So there was, a, there was a contract that came in ahead of time. Um, this slide shows all of the instruments that were installed. Many, most of these were installed by the contractor that came in ahead of time to remove this wall. So here's the 10-foot thick pile down here on this end. And here, here's that where it's shown removed in the tunnel envelope. So they had to dig shafts in the on ramp here and the off ramp there, remove the, all the piles that are in the tunnel envelope on both sides of their of their shafts, and then they installed all of these instruments to measure the impact of their work as well as the impact of the tunnel the tunnel boring machine going underneath and the installation of the tunnel underneath. So this is the profile view of the crossing of the freeway. Um, here's the, this is the 10 foot deep pile, thick concrete uh, wall, retaining wall, shown removed. This is where the, the U215, which was the previous contractor shaft was, backfilled with CDF. They installed these horizontal inclinometers, which were more or less an experimental um, instrument. Um, they, they, the idea is that each one of these is a 10-foot long inclinometer, and it, and it measures tilt. So you sum up the tilt from the start to the to the end, and that'll give you how much this has gone down. Um, it, we had a malfunction on the second drive. Uh, they all showed to be a, have a very small amount of tilt that added up to four inches. Here at one, it, it was a false reading, but we did end up having to drill holes in all the rings and, and, and proof route all of these rings because of that um, erroneous reading of that instrument. So this is southbound lane, northbound lane. Uh, this, is the, this is the express lanes. And then this is a 42-inch diameter storm drain. It's 8 feet from the top of the tunnel to the bottom of that, 13 feet from the pavement of the express lanes to the freeway. Uh, we were very concerned about our material. Finding one of these fault planes from the landslide and finding its way onto this freeway. This freeway is closed down from from uh, one o'clock to four o'clock um, every weekday in the morning, um, a.m. every weekday, and then for six hours on weekends it's closed down. The rest of the time it's running. So we had we were able to put in about five rings when it wasn't running, and then they started started it up again. Um, so we were very concerned about that. Uh, we, 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 we lowered the ETV pressure down. Thankfully, the water table was below the tunnel at this location, but we lowered the ETV pressure down to about a half a bar to try to prevent us from getting uh, soap onto the freeway, active freeway. We were very concerned that um, that would lead to a, a pretty bad traffic accident. So, so that was a big concern for us. Um, but despite our efforts, uh, uh, we still end up with some soap. It never made it into a travel lane, but it, the foam and fluids did make it uh, onto the freeway. So this was a vegetated slope. This is the freeway. Uh, there's a retaining wall, and there's a vegetated slope um, side with kind of a concrete. And this is a this is a pile or a, a column that holds up the holds up the freeway above. So this freeway above is drained by just an open hole right here. And what had happened is right above our our, uh, our our tunnel, there happened to be a drain right here, and it had and it had excavated hydraulically 
um, about a four foot deep um, excavation in this or hole in this uh, ed vegetated slope that was back, was filled up. You couldn't see the hole because it was filled up with um, pine cones and needles and all kinds of things that float. Um, and then there was ivy that was growing on this, so we couldn't see that there was a hole there. But our foam made it, found a way, probably through the backfill of this storm drain and and through a shear plane, it found a way up and and came out of that hole. Um, it got onto the freeway, and they closed the lanes down at at uh, one o'clock. Uh, the the wash dot, the uh, Department of Transportation, um, saw the issue, called us, and we. Moved in there, um, cleaned it all up with the back truck, and and backfilled this hole with um, tunnel grout, and got out, and and were able to clean it all up and get out of there in time for them to open up the freeway express lanes again um, the next morning. So um, it was we we'll categorize categorize that as the fourth time that our materials made it from the tunnel bore machine to the surface where we didn't want that to happen. Um, but once again, thankfully, that we was able to um, clean it up without any impact to the to the public. So, and then shortly thereafter, we finished the drive. Um, this is a reception shaft showing the seal, uh, the seal um, at Pine Street, and a shot of the tunnel bore machine heading back up Capitol Hill. This is an overpass over the freeway, over the. Um, and we did that at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, moved the four pieces back up, uh, set them up, moved them, slid them underneath the bridge, and got them in place again. Then we pulled the gantry out. There was 11 gantry sections. This is the gantry section right here. This happens to be the one that has the, gen, uh, the transformer on it. So all the electrical and cabling goes from here forward. And we pulled these eight, the eight gantries that are, this is gantry number eight, the eight gantries that are forward of this, we pulled out of one piece, and then we parallel parked it in the shaft, connected it to the, um, to the shielded portion of the TBM, um, and effected the fairly rapid turnaround and started tunneling on the southbound drive. So this is kind of a, on the southbound drive, we, this is a um, aerial photo, photo showing the blind rings are in the tunnel bore. The tunnel bore machine is actually um, buried at this point, and this is right before we started the installation of the continuous conveyor. So we we this show still shows the track where we mucked out the the launch um, with uh, muck cars, and then we transitioned to a uh, horizontal con or a horizontal conveyor, a tunnel conveyor, and this is the belt storage unit. In place, we had to make our muck bin, which had been this whole area, much smaller for the second drive because the U220 contractor was finishing up with their drive, and they needed to get their tunnel bore machines out of their shaft, out of their tunnel, so they could start the follow-on work. And this graphic shows this is our muck bin, and then this is the U220 work area that we gave up to them as one of our milestones. Uh, this is kind of a complicated slide, but essentially it's just showing this is our calculated EPB pressure based on um, the geotechnical information that we were given before we started the work. The, that's the red squares. The blue diamonds are the actual measured um, ambient pressure in the ground that we measured with the TBM as we did the first drive. And then the black line is our EPB pressure target pressure that we used on the second drive. You can see a significant reduction in the EPD pressure, which also reduces the risk that something um, could get to the surface um, and, and cause negative impacts to, to the public. So that's what that slide is intended to show. Uh, here's the sloping line curve of our, of our progress. Launched the first TBM right around the 1st of July. Um, the blue is the plan. The red is the is the actual. So our turnaround was pretty rapid here, and that allowed us, along with a little bit better production on the second push, uh, to beat the schedule a little bit. So this shows getting the TBM 
out of the second drive. We 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 were required to remove the cutter head. Um, we could have left the shield in place, but we knew that another job was coming and we wanted to use this TBM, so we had to figure out a way to get as much of it out as we could. We ended up getting everything out except for the tail pan. We left the tail pan in place. Um, this is this is the piles that were installed by the previous contractor when they dug this tunnel or this excavation was open cut right here. Um, there were tie backs that um, penetrated through our tunnel here, and then this is the shaft that we dug. Um, we had to excavate it and add it over um, to where we could get our, our pieces of our TBM, slide them across, and then this is a row of struts right here, so we had to slide them across and then slide them back, and then we could lift them out once we got them in this bay right here. And then and here's the slide of looking into the adit. That's the roof of the adit there. Uh, here's the remnants of the steel tie backs that we tunneled through. Uh, this is the wall that was installed by the previous contractor. Some more shots of removing the, the cutter head. It had to be braced and it was connected to this beam for stability and then um, slid out of the adit into the shaft. Here's another shot looking into the adit with the middle body coming out. And then this is a shot showing from inside the northbound tunnel um, into the shaft. This is the first of what row of struts, so it has to come out and then towards us for, for us to be able to pick it up. Um, then we move on to the cross passages. Um, there were two categories uh, of cross passages. The category one had no groundwater, um, and the category two had groundwater, required dewatering, and it also required pocket excavation and spiles. Um, at the time that we did the work, there were no toolbox items, but we were able to negotiate uh, um, some toolbox items where we had a unit price for permeation grouting, extra spiles. Uh, extra pocket excavation, that type of SEM or NATM type of, um, of best practices to prevent ground loss uh, during um, excavation using the SEM methods. Uh, we started the probe drilling for the cross passages late February, and we started excavation a few weeks later, and we finished excavation about six months uh, on, on the last cross passage, cross on um, about six months after the beginning of excavation. Uh, just a graphic kind of showing where we cut we cut the this is the cut in the in the in the segment segmental tunnel liner and then we excavate out this shows the advances about three feet um, probe holes uh, spiles grouted spiles uh, leading the excavation. A better graphic showing a Brock um, mini excavator in there, uh, the remote controlled excavator, and how it fit in the space that was shown. The final excavated space kind of had a barbell shape. It belled out for the rebar um, to beef up the connection between the running tunnels and the um, cross passage tunnel. Here's a shot inside the tunnel. This is the Brock, the yellow uh, piece of equipment, Brock. It's drilling. Uh, these guys are supporting the drilling on the man lift. Uh, vacuum excavation, lances. This is the, uh, the crown spiles that go in before the start of the excavation. Uh, there's a video that shows kind of the, this is the, the ground that was outside of the um, cross passage. So that drill's not doing anything to the ground. It's just flowing or extruding squeezing out of the excav uh, hole, as we're doing a, a probe hole here. So this is what the ground was like before we started. You can see that that's not very dewaterable, um, but we were able with vacuum dewatering to be able to uh, get that to a stable enough condition that we were able to do uh, SEM excavation. So here's the vacuum dewatering setup. I think there was um, in excess of 25 lances at this particular location all the way around the, the, the excavation at the end of the day and then into a header 
We had a vacuum pipe that ran the length of the tunnel, the vacuum pump down at Pine Street. And our, uh, so that vacuum, that vacuum header was kept um, at a, at a about uh, 5 PSI or so, um, or 10, 10 PSI below ambient air, atmospheric pressure, and then uh, the different lances were connected to it and, and adjusted so that we weren't um, losing pressure doing their vacuum uh, dewatering. Uh, some shots of the cross passages. This is a Category 1 cross passage. The ground, this is shot creed all here. This is the ground that we're excavating, pretty hard, glacially um, overridden, overconsolidated silt and clay. And we're using a road header um, grinding wheel with the Brock. This guy right here is running the Brock. It's a remote controlled piece of equipment. And here's a cool shot. It's just in here because it's a cool shot. But it's shot greeting. Um, we had a man up there doing that. Somebody supported him with the light. Um, and you can see it requires quite a bit of PPE to do the shot greeting in that, uh, that confined area. Uh, for finishing up with the waterproofing rebar, we poured the final liner inside the cross passages. Uh, shot of the rebar around the door. Uh, this is the this is the form for the concrete for the for the arch. And so all the, these um, shown here is wood wood form that's supported by ring beams. Uh, concrete pump, concrete delivery, um, hall unit uh, form work showing the uh, condition inside the tunnel with the cross passage supports that were installed and left in place until the concrete cured. Um, then the follow-on work was pouring this concrete. The invert had a drain pipe in it. It had, it had a, it had a uh, trench that was used was going to be used to to lay a uh, 26 kV, 24 kV um, power supply line for for the for the station to station connection for Sound Transit, and then um, a walkway that had a bunch of one, six conduits in it. Um, a standpipe, permanent fire protection, and lighting essentially, and that was that was the extent of the finished work that we did. Follow-on contractor came in, put in the catenary line, bought the trains, put in the the plinths and the and the the rail that the light ra that the light rail would run on, and other equipment was installed. Is has been installed by the follow-on contractor. Our contract was just this concrete. The, pipe, the stand pipe and the lighting. Uh, so we had to get started right away in the northbound with the finish work. This is a shot kind of showing that we're just getting started launching the TDM on the southbound drive and we're dropping down the Maxon unit to deliver concrete to start the invert pour um, immediately before the TDM is even, even buried there. Uh, this is shot invert's been poured. So, well, let me go back. And, so you can see here's the drain pipe and the invert it was just uh, covered with the invert, and then there's a there's a form right here that were for the for the uh, trench. There's the trench, and then the the pipe is buried. We're getting ready to pour the the put up the forms for the walkway. This is the embedded conduit in the walkway, a shot of the walkway, and doing there group shot before the launch. The first EDM, Brenda. Um, so there's a couple things. I got about five minutes to talk about a couple things that we did look at during this job. One of them was issue with the extended overcut. There's a lot of belief that the overcut is a void um, and it needs to be filled with grout, or there'll be settlement, which is true uh, for open face TDMs at least uh, above spring line for sure. But for EPB tunneling, we have over with 50,000 linear feet experience that it doesn't lead to additional surface settlement, um, especially in glacially deposited soil. The pressure uh, around the outside of the shield doesn't drop, so there's no reason for material that is in the overcut to actually flow into the to the cutter head. The, the stress levels remain the, almost constant, and that that material that overcut is backfilled essentially. It's not backfilled because it never becomes a void. The material that's cut and, and disturbed stays where it is in the in the outer 
in the overcut annulus. So the theory is is that these cutters just slice to the ground, disturb it. Um, some of it, because it does get, um, it's not compressible. Uh, glacially deposited materials usually aren't compressible. And so some of it does end up going towards the cutter head because this material has to go somewhere. Um, but most of it stays outside in the annular space. So this is the this is the center of the cutter head green and yellow is the, the rim of the cutter head. So that's our hypothesis um, that it's filled. Uh, the overcut never turns into a void. So we, we wanted to run an experiment. Um, at the beginning of this job, we needed to to convince the uh, all the interested parties that we weren't going to have problems above the tunnel um, either during our contract or in the future after we were gone. So what we did is we installed uh, sensors in the TBM shield um, and along the TBM used it as a giant sensor. And then we and installed sensors in the ground to see uh, and to compare these two, uh, the, the, the data we were gathering from the TBM and the data we were gathering from the ground to see what we were doing with the TBM and how, how it was impacting the ground around us. So here's a sh uh, slide showing what we had on the, on the TBM. Six EBV sensors on the back wall, two on the forward shield, two on the tail shield. These are sensors in the shield, EPB sensors, measuring the pressure or um, in the ground around the an in the annual space, essentially. Uh, two o'clock and eight o'clock is where they were located. And then we put uh, sensors in the grout uh, or the handling um, uh, port in the segments so we could see what it was. At the, as it exited the tail can, what the pressure was in the annual space. So we really wanted to know what the pressure was here, and then if it dropped, uh, if the pressure dropped around the TBM, allowing the material that that pressure should be supporting to drop into the annual space, which result in settlement above. There's dimensions. Um, and then piezometers and extensometers were installed in the ground at uh, five feet above the tunnel cone. And then we we um, also did soil samples of the an, of the material in the annular space um, to show that that material was capable of supporting the ground uh, uh, surrounding the annular space. So here's a sample. This is we had basically a uh, split spoon, if you will. Uh, did pocket penetrometers to see how strong the material was in the annular space. Um, this kind of shows, um, was pushed out with the, with the hydraulic ram, um, and, it, and it, when it hit the undisturbed ground, the pressures went very high, so we could tell the difference between the material that was disturbed and the material that wasn't disturbed. There's was a fairly large change in strength. Uh, disturbed soil was between a quarter and a half a ton per square foot, whereas the strength of the intact soil was um, eight to 16 times that. But the study uh, proved that the, the pressures did not drop in the annular space. The material that was in the annular space was not going to migrate out of it, um, and that the, our method of using 4-inch overcut um, did not lead to, to a greater chance of, of um, at least in glacially deposited soils, dense glacially deposited soils, there was no greater risk of a settlement using a four-inch overcut, and if at the end of the day, when we looked at the tunnel bore machine when it came out, if we'd have used shorter cutters, we would have ended up having to do um, some sort of intervention into the cutter head where we remove the material from the cutter head, and we, in our experience, that is the time when you have lost ground and you end up with uh, settlement at the surface in glacially deposited soils, and preventing uh, um, having to send guys out into the cutter head chamber having to remove material from the cutter head chamber and, and replace that material with air um, leads to a, a greater chance of settlement above you. Uh, the other thing that we had to do here is we had to look pretty hard at curves. So we did uh, the whole job was on a curve. It was 14 foot of straight tunnel in the um, northbound. And there was um, no straight tunnel in the southbound. So we had to build some 
special rings, and um, we had we ended up with ups, downs, and specials. Had a four foot taper on them. Uh, they were they were we were able to integrate the the special rings with the ups and downs, and so the overall we were able to get around that 550 foot radius curve without um, any ring damage above normal uh, amounts, expected amounts, and without any steps or issues with the tunnel um, waterproofing the permanent gasket. So overall, uh, the job was, was really quite a success, um, and we ran into quite a few things that we um, really uh, had to work on in regards to the curvature, in regards to dealing with um, trying to get the muck out in, in a dense urban environment and the fact that um, there's a lot of people on the streets all the time. And we were pretty concerned about the fact that we had four different occasions when if somebody had been someplace, um, thankfully they weren't where they would, could get hurt uh, when something happened down below. Um, so with that said, I guess we can go to questions. I guess i got to turn this over to Heather. Um, actually, Glenn, you can you can just leave it right there. I'm going to leave you in control um, in case you need to refer back to any of your previous slides. Okay. Um, but I'd like to start by thanking you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have had some questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and read those off to you now. The first question reads, could you discuss some about the risk assessment that was conducted during both design and construction phases, specifically with respect to geological conditions and the uncertainty in geological conditions? Um, so, so I can discuss what I imagined happened um, during design. I, I wasn't part of the design. I was, um, you know, I, we just came in as a contractor. We're given the GBR, and well, we're t told in this type of uh, procurement, a low bid, uh, hard money procurement, give us the price based on on this geology, and it's as shown in the GBR. So I, I imagine that the questions that came up, a lot of questions that came up in urban tunneling are the risk of settlement um, and the risk of, of boulders um, in the EPB tunneling. Um, so, so, so most of, of what they do in regards to geology is um, try to, to work out ways to require the contractor to give contingency plans for you know, being stopped by a boulder, um, going out and removing a boulder in front of the tunnel, the tunnel boring machine, um, as well as work plans that show how the contractor will um, will ensure that face support is is always applied during the construction, so that there's no no potential for lost ground. Which is one of the reasons why we we did the the study on the overcut was the concerns that 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 was going to lead to some you know small maybe 3 or 4% over excavation, maybe 5% over excavation, which would lead to settlement long term. Um, of course, in Seattle, there was quite a bit of over excavation on the first uh, EPB light rail tunnel. And so that was always a concern was you know, they wanted to make sure they were measuring the weight of the, of the material that's coming in to prevent over excavation. So, Analyzing the soil to determine if it would run or, or flow, more likely flow, um, and then requiring the contractor to write and have plans approved to show how they plan on preventing lost ground, applying face uh, support constantly, and, and then issues associated with the number of boulders that they might hit and how they would get through um, or remove boulders that stop the tunnel ball machine. Same thing goes for during, um, you know, when we were bidding the work, as we were, we're trying to determine how cohesive the material is, how fast the TBM is going to be able to advance through it. Essentially, in EPB tunneling, the easier the ground flows, which is generally considered to be bad ground, the faster the tunnel bore machine will go through it because the material really has to be turned into flowing ground in order to make it through the screw conveyor, onto the belt conveyor, up. And, and, and be in a, in a condition that you can um, get it to flow through your system, you want to turn it into running ground. So if it's already running ground, then um, you, you don't have to do nearly as much work um, to get it into that condition. 
Great, thank you. You mentioned faith support, and that actually relates to our next question. The question says, do you know what the reason for the 30% overestimation in required faith support during design was? Well, um, so so that wasn't so that wasn't that was yeah sort of during design. So so the contractors required the designer tells the contractor um, come up with a plan for what the face support that's required along the alignment will be. So the contractor does that you know in his planning portion of the work. Um, the the designer may do it themselves. They may come up with an estimate. Um, but the um, con but he doesn't share that with the with the contractor in a, in a low bid type of procurement. So what we do is when we're we're trying to determine what uh, the what the EPD pressure should be is is that we have to kind of go off of what's in the GBR, which is often um, you know it can be the actual water table pressures. Or it can be the uh, the worst case that the designer thinks they may encounter, um, because the GBR isn't really necessarily what, what's actually seen in in the in the investigation. It's uh, it's also ca uh, factors in uh, how much risk the owner wants to take. So so we use the worst case scenario of what the what the ground pressure might be, um, and we and we also use the worst case scenario of how much the ground might support itself when we come up with the with the EPD pressure to go, to start with. So so that's why there's a 30% increase in the in the EPD pressure based on what the ambient pressure is um, wh while you're tunneling. So once you tunnel through the ground once, then you actually are measuring the the true um, active earth pressure essentially every five feet, but really. At least every time you stop for the weekend, um, or we we typically run two tens, so we'll stop uh, for four or five hours every day, and at the end of that four or five hours, the EPD pressure has um, has stabilized to the actual active pressure that's pushing on the TBM from the earth. So so if you if you measure that and keep track of it, then you then you have the ability to go back and say. Okay, so it's not as bad as the worst case that was anticipated based on a borehole every 500 feet, which isn't surprising that it wouldn't be, um, because now we have data at least every, you know, 60, 70 feet that shows what the what the actual active earth pressure is along the alignment, and and so then that's a, a much lower risk interpolation um, on the second drive. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we only have a few minutes left for our session today, and we have some great questions coming in. I'd encourage you all to please reach out to Glenn um, at the information on the screen. And as a reminder, we are recording today's session, so we will be emailing you a link as soon as we have the recording available on the UCAM members website. Uh, so feel free to go there and view the other sessions that we've uh, previously hosted. Um, I'll go ahead and continue reading questions, Glenn, if you have the time um, to continue. Uh, the okay. next question reads, how long did you dewater across passage before you could excavate? And did you probe before you excavated to know the ground was dry enough? Yeah, so, so, so probing was required um, before, we, before we took the ring down. So the, the, big, the big thing um, is taken, is cut, you have to cut the ring out and you have to remove um, a big 10 by 10 piece of the tunnel lining. So you really need to be sure that your or your ground behind that ring is stable when you do that. Once you start excavating, you can excavate, you know, a pocket um, that's a one cubic foot and, and shock read it if you want. But the big the big step is removing the ring. So you have to know the ground is stable behind that ring before you remove it. Um, with the probe holding was probing was required. What we, we also did was we, we, when we were doing the probe drilling, we installed a piezometer um, right, you know, two feet into the, uh, into the excavation, into the cross passage um, envelope, and then we measured that, and, and we had to make sure that the, that the, the pore pressure in that, in that um, shown by that piezometer was less than a half a PSI above ambient, or we wouldn't take the ring down. Um, when we did vacuum dewatering, we installed 
um, four or five piezometers just outside of the vacuum dewatering to make sure that the, that the vacuum dewatering was maintaining the pressure. And we kept measuring those piezometers as we excavated because the vacuum dewatering would suck air from the excavation, actually. And so the effectiveness of the vacuum dewatering was dependent on how much of the open face you had shot had shotcrete, so the, sh the they couldn't the it, the air would would go into the vacuum dewatering glances from unshot um, creeded covered ground. So we had to minimize the amount of ground that didn't have a shotcrete cover in order to maintain the 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 pressure in the in the vacuum dewatering glances. So yes, um, quite a bit of quite a bit of 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 worry goes into making sure the ground's stable before you take the ring down, because that's the, that's the crux moment for the cross-passage excavation. That's great, Glenn. Um, we've got two more questions. Uh, the first one reads, what was the biggest lesson learned during U230, which you have used to adjust means and methods for Northgate Link? Um, so the biggest, I, I would say the biggest lesson learned that we had was to make sure somebody's keeping track of all of the vertical holes in the ground um, when, with any work that we're doing on the surface or underground to make sure that we don't, and we were really concerned about, you know, the four different times that we, that we had materials come to the surface in the urban environment. We kind of, we, we really anticipated the, the issue under the freeway, but we still weren't able to prevent it. Um, if we hadn't anticipated that, it would have been much worse, and, and we probably would have caused a traffic accident in express lane. So that's been our biggest, the biggest lesson that we learned here is that that's something that, you know, is it on the checklist uh, whenever we're doing planning for any work is where are the, where are the, uh, the, the watering wells, where are the borings, where are the instrumentation um, conduits, uh, and making sure that if we know where they are, they're clearly identified to everybody that's doing the work. Wonderful. Thank you, Glenn. Final question. How did you monitor buildings above the tunnel alignment for possible settlement damage? So, so the, most of the buildings um, on this job, on the U230 job, were uh, fairly old. A lot of them were masonry, you know, brick buildings. You know, most buildings in Seattle have been upgraded for, for um, earthquake protection, so, they, so, they're, so, so they're pretty stable compared to uh, a similar aged building in, in an area that's, you know, back east where there's not uh, earthquake um, risk. But um, they are susceptible to cracking, certainly, uh, with pretty, pretty minor um, differential settlements. So the, the, it was all designed and part of the contract. Uh, we, we put a lot of targets on the buildings. A few buildings um, and the, the wall of the freeway um, cut ended up with inclinometers on them to measure tilt. Most of the buildings were just shot by um, surveyors and uh, we just put targets up and then they would shoot the targets on a, on a regular schedule depending on where the TBM was or is in relation to that building. Um, on other contracts, the, the, uh, around, the, around the shafts, we used a robotic um, um, satellites that would automatically shoot on a regular basis all of the locations around the shaft. But under the tunnel boy machine on the alignment, uh, that just not, isn't cost effective, and you end up doing manual monitoring with surveyors. Great, Glenn. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and close today's session. But again, I'll encourage you all to please reach out to Glenn with the information on the screen. And please join us June 24th for our next webinar, The Challenges Based on the Regional Connector Project, again, hosted by the UCA Young Members. Um, we'll be emailing out a link to the recording of this session um, within the next 24 to 48 hours. And we hope you all have a wonderful day.